Luke chapter 23. As we are uh, going to uh, wrap up the exegesis of this section of the sixth trial that our Lord endured at the hands of man, uh, in this case by the hands of Pontius Pilate, and we see that uh, starting in verse 13 going all the way down to verse 25, uh, but here we are noting uh, the last section, which is really verses 20 through 25. This is that sixth trial. Pontius Pilate, uh, as we've already noted and as we will read once again as we wrap it up this evening, uh, in regard to Jesus' innocent, he found him completely innocent. There was no guilt in him whatsoever. Pontius Pilate questioned him at length found that he was innocent of all the false claims, charges, and accusations that were brought against him by the Sanhedrin, and in regard to that, uh, wanted to release him, but the crowd would not have it. And the crowd bullied Pilate in a number of different ways. They were insistent. They were that angry mob. As we're going to see this evening, they were absolutely operating in their emotional revolt of the soul, where their emotions were leading rather than the uh, the logic of the Word of God and Bible doctrine uh, resident within their soul or circulating through their soul. And again, they probably were a, uh, they absolutely were a crowd of unbelievers at this point in time. And so therefore, they had no word to cycle through their soul truly by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they were operating totally on their humanity and by their emotions and by their evil and anger, angered nature and really spewing the venom due to their hatred towards our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what we uh, are continuing to note this evening as we wrap up this sixth trial. And then uh, we'll, we'll uh, uh, talk about what happens next, uh, which not on a timeline, but according to two of the Gospels, the scourging of our Lord. So again, in verses 20 through 25, it's paralleled in all uh, three of the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four Gospels write about it. Here in verse 25, we see Pilate now taking his final action. And then after this, we really don't see anything or much of Pilate other than uh, 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 in regard to the body of Jesus Christ and also the placard that he writes above the head of Jesus Christ to hang there upon the cross. So let's look at Luke chapter 23, uh, once again in verse 20 and then down through 25. <coughs> All right, so now in verse 20 it says, But Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept on crying out, saying, Crucify, crucify him. And he said to them a third time, Why, what has this man done wrong? I have found no uh, in him, excuse me, I have found in his case no grounds for a, uh, uh, for a sentence of death. Sorry for tripping up on that. I'm so used to reading the 95 version. This is the 2020 version of the NASB. So it's a little different. All right. So I have found in his case no grounds for a sentence of death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices, demanding that he be crucified. And their voices began to prevail. Remember, prevail over Pilate and prevail over righteousness and justice. Verse 24, and so Pilate decided to have their demand carried out. Their demand was to crucify Jesus. He made a decision to allow that to occur. That's why then in verse 25, we'll exegete this tonight. And he released the man for whom they were asking, who had been thrown into prison for a revolt and murder, but he handed Jesus over to their will. So handing Jesus over to their will, as you absolutely understand now, is that he be crucified. So Pilate finally makes the last decision, takes his last action. He says, Barabbas, you uh, are now able to go free. I absolve you of your crimes and your sin. Now you're able to go free. But Jesus, you are going to be crucified. And he called for his guards to take Jesus away and then to crucify him. So here, what we see is Pilate taking his final action in this sixth trial at the hands of man of our Lord. 
As we know, there's one more trial that Jesus Christ is going to endure. It will be the only legitimate, the only righteous and just trial, and that is when he hangs upon the cross and he is tried for the sins of the entire human race as the sacrificial lamb and the substitutionary spiritual death that he will experience during that time period. That will be a trial at the hands of God the Father, judging the sins of mankind in the body and person of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. But here in this sixth trial, Pilate takes his final action after pronouncing the sentence of death or uh, through the form of crucifixion in uh, for our Lord Jesus Christ, as we noted in verse 24. Now he will release the scapegoat Barabbas, who has sin and evil and wickedness within his soul. He has been convicted of crime. He's been tried for crimes. He's been in prison for those crimes. And as a result, he is a guilty individual that has been found justly and righteously guilty. But because of this now tradition that they had at the Passover to release one prisoner uh, during that festival for the Jewish people, Barabbas is the one who will be let go. And that, too, was not a decision at the hands of Pilate directly, but he allowed the crowd to make that decision, as we've already studied and already noted. He allowed the crowd to make that decision. He gave them a choice, Jesus or Barabbas. Who do you want to be let go? They cried for Barabbas to be freed and Jesus to be crucified. So as a result, Barabbas becomes the scapegoat in the analogy that we noted in Leviticus chapter 16, as we studied and understood that scapegoat analogy, which is only mentioned there in all of Scripture, but very poignant to what is going on here now in this sixth trial of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, Barabbas was the one to go free. Jesus Christ was the one to give his life and have to be sacrificed for the sins of the entire world. And all of this is as the Jewish religious leaders had Desired. Now, there's a couple of interesting Greek words here between Pilate that we're going to see in the parallel verses and what's going on in the mentality of the Jewish leaders. And we have that similar type of English word, desire or wish, but yet applied in two very different ways between Pilate and and the Jewish leaders in regard to our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to note that and understand that as we now go back into the last phrases that both Matthew and Mark give to us in regard to this last action that Pilate takes to have Jesus crucified. And so as we've uh, 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 seen already in the past, but I'm going to give it to you uh, in detail this evening in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, and then in Mark chapter 15, verse 15, we see the parallel passages to what Luke writes about here in Luke 23, verse 25. Now, as we've also noted, the uh, two gospel writers, and these were the first two gospels to be written, they actually add a little bit more information and have it be uh, a, a little different emphasis than what Luke is writing for us here and then also what John writes about. And remember, John was the last gospel to be written. So in any case, in Matthew 27, 26, then he released Barabbas for them. Luke gives us that as well. But having Jesus scourged, and remember we pointed that out, he handed him over to be crucified. So as we note in Matthew, and then we're going to see Mark in just a minute, they both give us this scourging of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ coming at the end of the sixth trial. And then they portray it as if Jesus was scourged, then he was led away to be crucified. But in actuality, again, Luke doesn't get into the detail of that, doesn't even really mention it, other than that he will be punished by Pilate, or Pilate will have him punished. And then comparing Scripture with Scripture, we recognize that means he's going to be scourged. But then when we see the Gospel of John, which was the last Gospel to be written, many years later, and remember John wrote his Gospels to be somewhat parallel, but also to fill in important points and issues or uh, miracle signs and wonders and teachings of Jesus that the other gospel writers did not write about. 
So when John wrote his Gospels, he put the chronology into its right order, where Jesus was presented before Pilate uh, for that sixth trial. During the Pilate, he sent them away to be scourged, thinking that if he comes back as a bloody mess, as we're going to talk about in detail on Sunday, the Pharisees would have a sympathy for him and then say, okay, okay, enough is enough. Let's release him. He's suffered enough. But as you know, that wasn't enough for the Pharisees, for the angry mob, for the Jewish leaders. And they still called for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, even though he had been scourged almost to death, as we recognize. So John's gospel tells us that it happened in the middle of the sixth trial. G uh, uh, Jesus comes back before the court of Pontius Pilate, and then again, because his attempt to release him failed, even after having him scourged, then they c continue to cry out for Jesus to be crucified. Then John also tells us Pilate sentenced Jesus Christ to be crucified, and then he had him be led away by his own soldiers where they did crucify him at that point in time. So the scourging, even though Matthew, and as we're going to see in Mark in just a minute, uh, come at the end of the sixth trial, then leading right to the crucifixion, John says, no, 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 that happened. And then the trial continued for a little bit. Then Jesus Christ was led away to be crucified. So that gives us the chronology, and, uh, but we do uh, understand and recognize that both Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John all now uh, tell us at the end of this sixth trial that Pilate made the decision based on the pressure from the Pharisees to have Jesus Christ crucified. So here we have in Mark chapter 15, 15, it says, Wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. And so, again, we see that being very similar to what Matthew wrote about, other than the very beginning of it. And that beginning is kind of a very interesting word uh, and phraseology, as we see, coming from the Greek language. And as it says in Mark's Gospel, Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd. And so, what is that all about? Well, it's interesting that this uh, phraseology has an important Greek word here, which is bulomai, uh, okay, bulomai, and that does mean uh, 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 the will, the desire, a wish, uh, what they would want. And again, what we have here in the tense, wishing, desiring, willing, and wanting, okay? What's interesting about this word is that there's another Greek word called thelo, uh, T-H-E-L-O. I'm going to show you that in the next slide in just a minute, I believe, or a couple slides down. But in any case, there's a synonymous Greek word for our terms of willing, desiring, wishing, wanting, and that type of thing. But yet they have two different emphases. You see, the emphasis here in this word, again, bulomai, as we have it, it indicates making a rational decision, something that has been planned out. But it's still something that someone wants to do, but they're doing it from a rational standpoint. The cognate or synonymous word to this, again, uh, uh, thelo, as I've mentioned, is not in a rational way. It's not done in a rational way. You see, this other Greek word is talking more about, again, a whimsical type of decision, something that they're just flying off you know, the handle and wanting this to happen. In other words, it's not done in a rational, logical way. It's not done in a planned out way. So this word is given to us for Pilate's decision making that he is doing at this point in time. And what we talked about on Tuesday night was the shrewdness, first of the Pharisees, to pressure him in regard to the kingship of Jesus Christ and that he would be no friend of Caesar if he released him. And then Pilate came back and turned it right around. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. So he took his shrewdness and he turned it right back around on them. And now they condemn themselves, as we understood uh, on Tuesday night, by saying that we have no king but Caesar, when in fact God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, God is the king of Israel. 
from the foundation of the Israel nation. He was and is their king. We have no king but Caesar. So again, they self-condemned once again, but at the same time, Pilate in his shrewdness turned it around and said, oh, this is your king. Shall I crucify him? No, we're going to swear allegiance to the Roman Empire, the one that we hate, we want to overthrow, the one we want to get rid of. We're going to swear allegiance to the Roman Empire. We have no king but Caesar. So again, Pilate is acting very shrewdly. He is a very intelligent individual. Even though they were pressuring him and he did cave to that pressure, he still had his wits about him. And he wasn't operating in an emotional way as a good leader should. You see, Pilate was operating with knowledge and wisdom, knowing his audience, knowing the situation, knowing the bigger picture of what's going on, and then making a logical and rational decision as to what he's going to do. Now, the problem here is that the crowd was about to riot, and he didn't want that. And Pilate understood that it would be worse for the crowd to riot and the potential negative consequences that could have back on Caesar, especially if that word went all the way back to the uh, emperor back in Rome, he thought that to quell the anger and the rioting nature of the crowd would be more beneficial for him and the society than to get rid of this individual, Jesus Christ. Because that seems to be what they all wanted. And again, he was only seeing a small segment, as we talked about you know, last week, a minority of the population. But in any case, he makes a good, rational decision, and now that becomes his desire and his want. And so wishing is one word we could utilize there, but desiring to calm the crowd and to give them what they wanted, Pilate makes a decision. Rather than being an impulsive decision, like we're going to see in regard to the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leadership, coming up in just a minute. But in any case, we see the rationale that uh, Pilate is going through. We see him making a good decision. He wants to satisfy the crowd. We have the word hykanos, and then aklos is the word for crowd. But hykanos uh, means to make sufficient, to make adequate, uh, to be large enough. Sometimes you can use it that way. All right. Uh, an adjective uh, in the Greek language. <clears throat> but he wants to do what he has to do to get them to calm down. Just, you know, bring about peace to this whole situation because it's starting to get out of hand. So now I have to do something to calm this all down so that we can have, quote unquote, peace in the society now going forward. Peace in the moment going forward so that they all would calm down and now go forward. And so when we look at this word, uh, boluomai, it means to satisfy, appease, placate, pacify, all these things. We could utilize any one of these words in this translation to give it the true meaning as to what he was trying to do. So as it says, you know, wishing to satisfy the crowd, okay, that's what he was all about. He wanted to, his desire was to placate the crowd, to pacify the crowd. You know, it's like the little baby when they whine and cry. What do you do? You take the pacifier and you plug it in their mouth and say, okay, quiet down now, okay? Because they have their little, you know, their little sucky that they can suck on, okay? That's basically what he was doing here. He was giving something to them to calm them down. And he didn't want the ride. He didn't want them to be out of hand. And he wanted it to be a peaceful situation. This also uh, indicates to us that the releasing of Barabbas and the sentencing of Jesus to death was purely a political move. So when we see Pilate operating in a rational way and his desire with logic going on in the mentality of his soul, understanding the full landscape of what's going on, again, he's re we recognize this is a political move. And we've already talked about that, how he's already thrown righteousness and justice right out the door. Because he found Jesus innocent three times. Fourth time, uh, Herod found him innocent. So three plus one times he was found innocent. Pilate did not want to have anything uh, to do uh, with his death. 
but yet he still made the decision to sentence him to death, and he threw righteousness and justice out the door. So this was a political move, as we've noted, and he continues on in that. And so to appease that crowd, he releases Barabbas, Apo Luo, as we've talked about, set free. Luo is the root word that means to loose and to let loose, all right? Apo Luo is the emphatic uh, word in regard to loosing. But here we have a hardened criminal who's gone through the judicial system, been found guilty, sentenced to death. This guy's going to get released. But in that releasing, as we've noted early, and we see it coming back once again, we see that great analogy of the scapegoat. And again, back in Israel, on the Feast of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, they would take two goats. They would take one goat, and they were, the priest would put his hands upon the head, both hands on the head, as we talked about, for the double emphasis of the transference of sin. And he would name the sins of Israel over that goat. Then he would take that goat to the gate. An attendant would come and lead that goat out into the wilderness and let him go free. Let him go free. The goat that was filled with sin. But then the other goat, they would take, bring it to the altar, and slay that goat in the sacrifice for the sins that the other one is taking away. So this Barabbas, Jesus Christ, and again, bringing it up for you one more time, is that great analogy found in the scapegoat analogy and ceremony that God gave to Israel thousands of years or hundreds of years prior. And Barabbas is that perfect scapegoat. And why is that? Because he was found guilty of insurrection and murder. Again, stasis and phonos. We've talked about both of these words, the insurrection or rebellion, <coughs> sedition. Any of those uh, types of words would uh, 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 be f sufficient here. And then phonos for murder. And in regard to this murder, too, you've got to think about, okay, if he's leading a rebellion and an insurrection, who's he killing? His fellow Jews? No. He's killing Romans. And he's probably killing Roman soldiers. So the ones that he murdered were Roman citizens. And for a Jew to kill a Roman citizen, that's way out of line. That is just way out of line. You know, it was one thing for a Roman to kill a Jew. The Romans didn't find that quite so bad, okay? But for a Jew to kill a Roman back in those days, unheard of. And if it was found out, there would be severe consequences. And this guy was found guilty of that. And as a result, it says he was thrown into prison. Again, balo is the Greek word for thrown here. And then phulek is the word for prison. So he committed the crime. He committed the sins. He was convict he was uh, arrested for the sin or the, the crimes. He was tried, he was convicted, and he was sentenced. And his sentence was a sentence of death. And he should have been crucified at this point in time. But yet he is the one who was allowed to go free. Pilate used him as that great offering of the now Passover tradition. Again, Pilate had no idea about the, uh, the Feast of Atonement and the scapegoat uh, tradition that the Israelites had. But for whatever reason, they brought this kind of mercy and grace to the Passover celebration at this point in time in the Roman society uh, uh, in Jerusalem. And they would let one prisoner go. This was a tradition. And he could only let someone go who was condemned. If somebody was still going through the, the, the jurisprudence process, he couldn't use that person because they're not found guilty yet. He had to have a guilty one. And Barabbas was one. Yet Pilate's strategy, as we know, absolutely failed, kind of blew up in his own face, as we understand, because he wanted to use Barabbas so that Jesus could go free because he found no guilt in Jesus, but that blew up in his face. Now he has to kill Jesus, but at the, uh, an innocent man. But at the same time, he creates a problem for himself potentially down the road because here he is releasing a man who is trying to overthrow the Roman Empire and killed Roman citizens. 
Roman soldiers, Roman citizens. Severe crimes in the Roman Empire. So again, it all, so whatever decision Pilate's making here, it's all blowing up at his face. If he releases Jesus, you're no friend of Caesar. He claims to be a king. Here comes a king. You let him go. Now he lets go of Barabbas. Here's a guy who's trying to overthrow the government, killed Roman citizens, who's a Jew, and you're letting him walk free. So again, you know, Pilate had all kinds of problems. Again, the Bible doesn't give us consequences of that down the road, but I'm sure that there were, and I'm sure there were issues associated with all of this. And so now, because of this tradition that they had established, Pilate was duty-bound to release Barabbas. Yet didn't he fail in his duty for Jesus Christ? You see the hypocrisy here? Now he's duty-bound to release Barabbas, but yet in Jesus' situation, who is absolutely innocent, he's condemning him to death. And so from Pilate's standpoint, it's hypocrisy at its finest. So we've talked about the pressure. We talked about the reasoning. We understand what he's doing and why he went about doing it. It was all wrong, all illegal, all unjust, all unrighteous, just as the other previous five trials of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ were as well. The only true legitimate trial that is it has uh, righteousness and justice uh, associated in it is when Jesus is hanging on the cross and being judged for our sins by God the Father. So here we see Pilate failing dramatically, but in that failure we see the great analogy of the scapegoat being fulfilled. The one who was filled with sin, murder, insurrection, who knows other sins and uh, crimes that he committed as well that aren't mentioned here. He gets to go free. And the one who is absolutely innocent, had no sin of his own, he is the one that has to pay the penalty for the sins. And isn't it interesting that the ones that determined to release Barabbas, even though Pilate said the words, remember it was the high priest that called, Barabbas, 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 who should I release? They said, Barabbas. The high priest made the decision as to which one would be the scapegoat to go free. And they rightly chose the sinner, according to the atonement tradition. Yet they had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> they had no idea. Maybe in 2020 hindsight, they reflected upon it and said, oh, okay, maybe. You know, I'm sure the uh, Caiaphas and Annas didn't ever come around to it. But certainly other uh, members of the priesthood did. Because not only were there believers of that priesthood that weren't part of this uh, at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, but I'm sure many of them became saved after the fact as well. But again, only God knows that. We'll find out more about that when we get to heaven. But the high priest chose the scapegoat, and the high priest chose the one that would remove the sin, that would take it out of the city and go free. And that's why, again, it's kind of like, um, you know, uh, in Hebrews, it talks about Jesus Christ being a unique kingship and a unique priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. Okay? And Melchizedek is only mentioned briefly in the story of, uh, of uh, 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 Abraham, okay? Very briefly, the story of Abraham. Kind of comes and he goes, and that's all we hear about him until you get to Hebrews. And then assuming Paul's the writer of Hebrews, he said Jesus Christ is the king priest in the order of Melchizedek. And there's all kinds of analogy there. But it was unique king priesthood, not from the Levitical priesthood, but it was unique. And we don't see him again. Well, in a similar type of uh, fulfillment and analogy, the scapegoat would go free, never to be seen again. Barabbas is never mentioned again. Even extra-biblical writings don't even say anything about Barabbas after this moment. And he's gone, never to be seen again. Again, a great analogy of the removal of our sins. And again, we know that Jesus Christ is the one who took those sins upon himself and also the one that ultimately removed those sins from us because he paid the penalty for it. But Barabbas is the visual or the object lesson for us to understand that. Just as we're going to see on Sunday when we talk about the scourging of Jesus Christ 
and the uh, extreme suffering that he endured in that scourging because we can understand it and it gives us an object lesson to understand so that we can uh, truly have a better perspective when Jesus was on the cross paying the penalty for our sins and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's not saying that because he's suffering as a crucified human being. He's saying that because he's now paying the penalty for our sins and has separation from God the Father, which was more excruciating to him than all the physical suffering that he was enduring. And it was extreme physical suffering. But again, that was given to us so that we can have a better appreciation for what our Lord did. So as Barabbas gets released, Jesus Christ is the one now that is going to be taken to be sacrificed. And they led him away to be crucified. And again, on the Feast of Atonement, the high priest would take this goat who had no sin and bring it to the altar and, again, sacrifice it on behalf of the people. Now Jesus Christ is the one that's going to be sacrificed at the altar. And again, the altar now being his cross and the cross of Jesus Christ for the payment of the penalty of our sins and the sins of the entire world. And so then it goes on to say, but he delivered Jesus to their will. This is the leading away of that sacrificial animal. Jesus will now be led away. And so in Mark's account, we see Mark talking about Pilate desiring from a logical, rational viewpoint to appease the crowd, to calm them down so that they would not continue to riot and there would be peace. Now we see in Luke's account, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Uses a completely different Greek word for a reason. Because this word, thelema, Again, with, where its root word is thelo, as I uh, uh, mentioned to you previously. And again, giving you detail in your notes as well. This word means the same thing. Will, desire, sometimes determination. What somebody wants to do. And then we have the genesis of atas, which is places, uh, you know, it's squarely onto the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin of them or theirs, we would translate it. So but he delivered Jesus to their will, what they wanted, what they desired. And again, uh, thelema uh, is the root from th uh, thelo. And when we look at the root word thelo, which is synonymous to balu omai, as we mentioned earlier, it means the same thing, but the context is very different. Because thelo and now thelema have the context of impulsive type of wish or desire. In other words, rationale and logic is just thrown out the window. These folks are just operating based on their emotions. They have an emotional revolt of the soul, and they just want what they want, and basically they've lost their minds at this point in time. Yeah, they were shrewd. They had tactic. They were trying to convict Jesus prior. They tried it in all five of the trials that Jesus Christ went through and now into the sixth trial. But now they're losing their minds. And it's now nothing more than an emotional revolt of the soul. And as you and I know, this is not, not how members of the human race should operate and certainly not how believers should operate. We don't operate by our emotions. And we don't let our emotions rule our soul. Emotions have been given to us by God as a beautiful and great responder to what is happening. But not to lead us in our decision-making authority. You see, our decision-making authority is based on the Word of God resident within our soul, which we ha learn, understand, and then apply in a rational and logical way. In faith, as we trust God, and through the power and the filling of God the Holy Spirit, to lead us in that rational, logical thought process in whatever situation we're in. You see, we get into trouble as when we operate by our emotions, 
When we let our emotions rule, we're going to be making decisions. We're going to regret one way or another. We're going to say something we shouldn't be saying. We're going to do something we should not be doing. But when we operate with the Word of God and Bible doctrine resident within our soul through the power and the filling of God the Holy Spirit, we will be operating based on divine viewpoint and what the Word of God has to say and how we should logically and rationally be treating and thinking about uh, and saying and doing in each situation. But here the Pharisees had thrown it completely out. Pilate, again, Mark uses the word. Pilate's operating that way. He's being that good soldier that he was trained to be. He's being that good judge that he was trained to be. You see, and with the training that Pilate had, he, as a Roman soldier, was trained not to let the things around you dictate to you how you should function and operate from your emotions. Because when those soldiers would get into war, all hell breaks loose. And there's carnage all around with loud noise and screaming and arrows flying. And if you're going to lose your mind in that situation, you're going to make bad decisions, and especially as a leader. You're going to make mad, bad decisions for your troops. And you are assured of losing the day. So they were trained. Trained to be, you know, have the relaxed mental attitude, the peace within their soul. Again, from a humanistic standpoint. They were trained to not allow the things going on around them to get uh, uh, um, emotional within their soul. They were trained how not to be irrational in your decision-making process. They were trained how not to deal in fear. And Pilate was operating in that way from a humanistic standpoint. But now you and I should be training our soul. And you see, the Word of God does that for us. You see, the Word of God trains your soul how to think. The Word of God trains your soul how to think rationally and logically in situations. The Word of God teaches you what's right and what's wrong. And the Word of God has given you many, many promises that you ought to claim by faith and trust in God and then apply that to the situation. And just as the soldier, whether it be the Roman soldier or soldiers in our own military today, they are trained to keep their cool in chaotic situations. The Word of God does that for you, but guess what? It gives you even more power. Because not only are you trained within your soul to have that right mental attitude, but you've got the power of the Word of God and the filling of God the Holy Spirit to apply that in your life. So we as believers have no excuse to be operating under emotional revolt of the soul. We have no excuse to let fear, worry, anxiety, or anything else lead us in a negative direction as to how we should be thinking and functioning and operating. We should never lose our cool. We should never lose our minds. And we should never let our emotions rule the day. So again, we have a great example here. Pilate was doing that as a trained soldier. You are a trained soldier in the army of God. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, pick up and put on what? The full armor of God. Does a civilian put on armor? No, he does not. Does a soldier put on armor? Yes, he does. Or she does. Okay? You see, the soldier puts on the armor of God and wins the day. Pilate was operating that from a humanistic standpoint, but in contrast to that, the Pharisees are not. And that's why we have the two different Greek words here, to show the difference. And these guys were losing their mind. And as I have up on the board, irrational, illogical, impetuous, anything else you want to rhyme, uh, 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 be synonymous with those words. They were losing their minds. 
and they had emotional revolt of the soul, and that's why they were screaming out what they were screaming. They had no sense of divine viewpoint. They had no sense of righteousness and justice. They just wanted what they wanted based on their emotions and their fears, their worries, and their anxieties. Especially as it all started because they were afraid of Jesus and him taking away their authority and their responsibility, which he would have done because they were going in an absolutely wrong direction and teaching the people wrongly. But if they humbled themselves and turned to the Word of God, he would have kept them in their positions of authority and power because they would have been doing a right thing in a right way. And they would have come to salvation and accepted him. But they did not. And so between these two individuals, here we have Pilate sentencing Jesus to death. And as we talked about last week, oh yeah, he washed his hands. <laughs> Tried to self-absolve. Didn't no good. He still is responsible because he made the decision. And it was an unjust and an unrighteous decision. But he did it from a logical rationale to appease the crowd from a humanistic standpoint. You see, if he had divine viewpoint, he would have released Jesus and said, you guys get out of here. And he would have had his Roman guard come down on them heavy for bringing false charges and false witnesses in false accusations and false crimes. He would have dealt justly if he had divine viewpoint. So that's his failure. They're operating from their emotional revolt of the soul. That's their failure. Whose sin is worse? Whose sin is greater? Hopefully you know the answer. None of the above. <laughs> because a sin is a sin is a sin. In God's eyes, one sin is equal to another sin. Yes, there are sins that God hates, okay? And there are sins that are an abomination to Him. But all sin is sin in God's eyes. And all sin required a Savior. And all sin requires forgiveness whether it be the little white lie or the insurrection murder. So a sin is a sin is a sin. Pilate operated in injustice, the mob operating in anger and hatred, emotional revolt of the soul. So it's just a big sin fest going around here, okay? And it's all humanistic. It's all fleshly. None of this is right from a, a, a divine viewpoint standpoint. But God knew this would happen, as we know. And God utilized all of their sin and their evil ultimately to bring about the greatest good the world has ever known and will ever know. And that is Jesus going to the cross and paying the penalty for our sins. So the contrast uh, in the four Gospels bring out uh, several uh, interesting points as we uh, wrap up the exegesis and uh, wrap up really the sixth trial. And as I said, we're going to come back on Sunday and we're going to talk about the scourging, which I'm going to kind of just you know remove it from the trials and say this is a whole separate thing, even though it's part of the sixth, tri uh, sixth trial. But in any case, uh, we have several points that are brought out here. First is that we see from Matthew and Mark's Gospels, we know that handing him over in Luke means to be crucified. So when, pa when Luke says he handed him over to their will, they were screaming for crucify. Matthew and Mark put it plainly, yeah, he's getting crucified, okay? So handing him over means that he's going to be crucified. The scourging, as we know, has already happened. There's a little respite from that process. And again, not only that, but the beating, uh, the crown of thorns and beating him over the head, which we'll uh, talk about as well in the scourging process. But there's a little respite here, and Jesus is before the crowd once again. And then the final sentence comes down. He's handed over. That means he's going to get crucified. Number two is that we note that Luke and John in their Gospels are placing the responsibility for Jesus' crucifixion squarely upon the Jewish religious leaders. Pilate gave them over to their will. 
It was their will. This is what they wanted. And they're the ones responsible. They had a choice between Barabbas and Jesus. They chose Jesus to be crucified. Squarely, the responsibility comes on to them. And they even said, when Pilate was washing his hands, I have nothing to do with this man's blood. And what did they cry out? They weren't even elicited to cry out. Okay, They just offered it up on their own. His blood be on us and our children. Poor kids. <laughs> Poor kids. Okay, And this wasn't even elicited from Pilate. He didn't ask for that. He just said, I'm washing my hands. They could have kept silent. But instead, they bring down a curse on themselves. And then, again, the other idiotic statement, as we've seen, we have no king but Caesar. <laughs> Our allegiance is not to God in heaven. It's to this Roman governor who also, as you know, the emperors proclaimed themselves to be gods as well. And that might be a little bit later in the emperor history, but again, uh, that's kind of how it all shook, shook down. So again, from uh, Luke and John, the responsibility comes to the Jewish religious leaders. Matthew and Mark are vague on this, okay? And they just kind of keep it plain and simple, and they talk about the process more than, you know, who really is the one. But we know, uh, you know, from our studies that, you know, they both are culpable, both uh, Pilate and the Jewish Sanhedrin. Number three is that Luke emphasizes that it is the will and desire of the Jewish religious leaders to have Jesus Christ crucified. And again, we talked about the will and desire being the emotional revolt of the soul. They're not thinking in log logical rationale. They're certainly not thinking divine viewpoint. They're not thinking from a biblical perspective. And just think about all the little scenes and all the little clues that we've talked about and explained throughout this process that talk to the prophecies from the Old Testament. Talk to what God was giving to them in the law and in the prophets. And if they just step back and thought a little logically for a minute and search their scriptures a little bit more, they too would have come to the realization that Jesus was the Messiah. I don't know if you've uh, seen the, uh, the series Chosen, recommend it for everybody. Again, as I say, a lot of, uh, um, um, oh, what's kind of licensing? Poetical licensing? What is that? Artistic licensing, that's it. A lot of artistic licensing. They make up stories, they add it in, but all the stuff they're making up and adding in are trying to paint the picture, okay? So that you can, you know, especially for the layperson to totally understand. Frustrates me a little bit in watching these things. Oh, that didn't happen, that didn't happen, you know? But yet, it tells the story, okay? But in any case, part of the storyline, especially in uh, season three at the end there, or middle, middle to the end, um, were two Pharisees. One was a scribe, one was a Pharisee. And they both have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Based on what? Searching the Scriptures. And many of the Pharisees did, like Nic Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. They came to believe because they searched the Scriptures. And they said, wait a minute, Scripture says this, Jesus is doing this, and He is this. Put the two together, He's the Messiah. And they came to faith. So, again, this group is not there, okay? They're not there. Instead, they are acting in emotional revolt of the soul, humanistic viewpoint. They want Jesus crucified. They're acting like, more like mobsters than they are religious leaders. Now, in verse four, uh, the fourth point is that their sinful humanistic will is overriding all justice and righteousness at this time. As I said time and time again, it's all thrown out the window. Only God the Father operates in His trial of Jesus on the cross in that way. But from their sinful, humanistic viewpoint, righteousness and justice is thrown out the door. And that's why you too have to be careful not to get in emotional revolt of the soul, not to get in humanistic viewpoint about what's going on in the world and, you know, this one and that one and this situation and that situation, what this friend is doing or what that uh, person on the job is doing, okay? You've got to stop applying humanistic viewpoint to those things. Instead, look at it from divine viewpoint. 
you know, and I'll give this to you now, but I'm going to uh, emphasize it on Sunday. I had to write it down so I'd remember the phrase that, I, uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit led me to. But why was Jesus able to endure all this? Why was he able to endure on this, all this? You know why? Because it wasn't about him. It wasn't about him at all. It was about everybody else. You see, he was here to serve all of mankind. And that was his motivation. And that's why he was able to endure so much. You see, when you are thinking about other people, and when you are thinking about your responsibility to serve other people, you're going to be able to endure way more than you ever thought you can endure. And you'll be able to endure all things. But when you turn your eyes back around on yourself and start to think about you, that's when you lose it. That's when emotional revolt of the soul comes in. And that's when you can't serve. And that's when you can't endure. When it becomes about you. So again, make it about other people. Make it about everyone else. And when you have your focus there and not on yourself, you don't care what happens to yourself. Whatever will be, will be. But the important part is whatever does happen to me doesn't matter because it's about what I am able to do for them. And again, doing it for my Lord. So remember that. And we'll talk more about that, especially when we see Jesus endure the scourging. Point five, and two more to go, and we'll be done, is as in God's permissive will, he allowed their evil, he allowed their sin, and their sinful uh, will to rule the day. At this time, just as he did in the story of Balaam, all the way back in Numbers 22, where Balaam wanted to, for hire, put a curse on the people of Israel. But God said, no, no, no. <laughs> but God let him go almost to the point of cursing because he let his will be done. And in God's permissive will, he allows certain evils to happen. But yet in the end, God utilizes all of that for his good, especially for those who love him. Remember, all things work together for good. Don't lose the point for those who love him. It's not just all things work together for good. For the Christian or the believer, not even that. For those who love him. Which means you're following him, you're learning from him, you're applying and you're serving for him. So his permissive will is in view here. But God's going to turn it all around for good in just a few hours from now. And then as we wrap it up, ver uh, point six is that even though it would be the Roman soldiers who would crucify Jesus, he was crucified because of the will and the desire of the Jewish leadership. They are the ones that wanted him destroyed. They are the ones that led to his destruction. They just used Pilate as a pawn in their game of chess. And it worked out beautifully for them. So they thought. <laughs> but in the end, as you know, very disastrous for them all. But in any case, even though the Roman soldiers were doing the act, we can't take culpability away from the Jewish religious leadership at that time. And again, it's not all Jews and we don't like Jews because they crucified Jesus. No, get that out of your thought. That's anti-Semitic. This small group of Jewish leadership 2,000 years ago did this. They were the ones responsible. And unfortunately, they called a curse upon themselves and their children. But they're the ones who are responsible. And they're the ones who are going to be held account as well. So in any case, uh, that uh, concludes our understanding of Luke's account of the sixth trial. And now as we come back, we'll talk about that portion of the sixth trial as a separate entity called the scourging of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll do that on Sunday. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your long suffering, your patience, your loving kindness, and also that of your son, Jesus Christ, especially in our behalf. And Father, we can't thank you enough for what he endured for us so that we could have salvation and eternal life. And help us also, Father, to have that same kind of love in our heart for others as we serve others rather than ourselves and therefore are able to endure. So, Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask for travel blessings on our way home. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you very much.